stuff. Um, hi, everyone who's here so far. Um, my name is Sully Coleman. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Vermont Center in Behavior and Health, and I'm working with um, Dr. Higgins and Dr. Galima. Uh, I'll be moderating today's poster session. Um, so just a couple of items. Um, today, we'll spend about like five to seven minutes on each presentation, and then we'll have time to take um, one or two questions after each presentation. And, you know, since there's only four presenters, I think we're going to have plenty of time. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that should do it. Um, I guess we can go ahead and get started then. Our first presenter is Suyong Kim from Penny Associates Incorporated. And she is going to be presenting um, on adult smokers complete switching away from cigarettes at six, nine, and 12 months after initially purchasing a Juul cigarette. So, um, Sue Young, if you would like to take control. Sure. Let me share my screen. This is the most nervous thing sharing screen on Zoom these days. Okay. Can you all see it? Yep. Awesome. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Suyang Kim and thank you for the kind introduction and I appreciate everyone joining this late afternoon sessions. Um, along with my colleagues Saul and Meg here, uh, I'll be presenting adult smokers complete switching away from cigarettes at multiple repeated time points after initially purchasing a dual cigarette, cigarette at baseline. So please see our disclosure on conflicts of interest. So as we all know, electronic nicotine delivery system or end have the potential to benefit public health if smokers completely switch from cigarettes to ends for an extended period of time. In a study on adults who just purchased a dual starter kit, about half of them reported past month switching at month two, month 12, sorry, as in they did not smoke at all in the past 30 days, not even a puff. In this study, the endpoint was set with repeated point prevalence of switching, or RPPS, an acronym, and it was defined as three consecutive reporting of no past 30 day smoking at month six, nine, and 12 at all three time points. So the sample included about 12,000 baseline adult smokers from the ADJUST study. The study included three armed aims. First, how many achieved our PPS at the end of the study period? Second, what factors are associated with the RPPS outcome? And third, among about 10,000 participants who did not achieve our PPS, how did the cigarette consumption change with their dual use? So among the participants, about 21.6 point of them uh, reported our PPS that they did not smoke not even a puff of cigarettes in the past month at three consecutive uh, follow-up surveys, month six, nine, and 12. Second, our PPS was associated with lighter baseline smoking history, uh, such as fewer days, fewer cigarettes, and fewer years of smoking history, as well as lower baseline cigarette dependence. Of the dual use behaviors, month three and month six characteristic have different implications on RPPS as RPPS was defined with six, nine, and 12 month uh, switching behaviors. On month three, for old participants, daily use of Juul and greater subjective reinforcing effect from Juul measured with the MCEQ scale were significantly associated with, with achieving RPPS in the later months. On month six, which is the part of the outcome definition of our PPS, for those who already reported past month switching at month six, really use and same uh, greater reinforcing effects measured at that month six, significantly help them maintain their switching status at month nine and 12. But how about those who did not achieve our PPS? Were there any changes in their cigarette consumption? Even, even if they were still smoking. Most of the non-RPPS participants have su substantially reduced their average CPD or cigarette per day, especially 
those who reported switching at least once or twice, although they did report smoking once or twice on the, uh, the uh, wave that did not report switching. This shows about 80% reduction in CPD, even in the month they were smoking. Indeed, the majority of the RPPS participant reduced their CPD by half or more when they were smoking. To summarize, about one fifth of adult smokers reported no past 30 day smoking at three consecutive follow ups, which has been used as a proxy for sustained switching. Daily use of Juul and stronger subjective reinforcing effects were important predictors for achieving and maintaining RPPS. For even those who uh, did not achieve RPPS, they reported substantial reduction in cigarette consumption. So in conclusion, these findings suggest that ENDS may act as a substitute for cigarettes for smokers, which, which implies the strong potential for public health benefits. These are the references and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do we have any questions? Okay, um, I think we can probably move along. Um, it looks like Nicole Krebs is still not present. So we'll go to Jonathan Schultz, who is also from the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. Um, he is going to be presenting today on tobacco product use among US adults with disabilities and presenting findings from the 2019 National Health Interview Survey. So go ahead and take it. All right, thank you. Let me see if I can figure this out. Okay, can everyone hear and see the screen? There it is, yep. Okay, and you can all hear me good. All right, thank you all for being here. Um, as Sully said, I am with the uh, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. I'm a postdoc there. My name is Jay, and I'll be talking a little bit about tobacco product use among US adults with disabilities. So people with disabilities are frequently not considered their own demographic or recognized as a health disparity population. However, people with disabilities who make up about 25% of the US population report higher rates of obesity, lack of physical activity, and having poorer health as compared to people without disabilities. Uh, national data also suggests people with any disability have a higher prevalence of smoking cigarettes than those who do not report a disability. So the purpose of this project was to present the national prevalence of tobacco product use by disability and type, and to describe associations between tobacco product use and disability and type. So we use data from the National Health Interview Survey, which provides health information on US adults. Disability was defined by how participants responded to questions relating, related to functioning in vision, hearing, mobility, communication, cognition, and self-care. And respondents could respond to the questions with no difficulty, some difficulty, a lot of difficulty, or cannot do at all. So those are asked like, do you have um, difficulty seeing even when wearing glasses? Do you have difficulty hearing even when having a hearing aid? And then respondents can say no difficulty, some difficulty, a lot of difficulty, or cannot do at all. Uh, we assess the current and former use of cigarettes, e-cigarettes, cigars, regular pipes, and smokeless tobacco. Oops, too far. Okay, so the following graphs depict the prevalence of current and former slash non-current tobacco product use. Uh, along the y-axis is percent, and please note that the y-axis does go to different levels. And on the x-axis is population and people who report various difficulty to any disability. 
Compared to those who report no difficulty, the prevalence of current cigarette smoking was higher for any disability. So um, the prevalence for any disability was 21.2 versus 11.5. And although not shown in these graphs, um, the prevalence was higher only in those adults who reported a lot of difficulty or cannot do at all to the vision, hearing, mobility, and cognitive um, functioning questions. And current cigarette smoking was also higher for those reporting some difficulty in all functioning domains compared to those who reported no difficulty. For the remaining products, prevalence was similar for people who report any disability and those who do not report a disability. And I'm going through this a little kind of quickly um, so that we have time for questions. It's in the poster that I think we put beforehand too, so you can look at it um, online. Uh, however, after adjusting for sociodemographic factors, the odds of currently using each tobacco product were significantly higher for adults who reported a lot of difficulty or cannot do at all to any disability. And additionally, looking at specific disability types provides us some more information, including that people who report a lot of difficulty with vision have significantly higher odds of using cigarettes. People who report a lot of difficulty with hearing have significantly higher odds of using smokeless tobacco. People who report a lot of difficulty with mobility have significantly higher odds of smoking cigarettes and pipes. People who report some difficulties in communication have significantly higher odds of using cigarettes. People who report a lot of difficulty in cognition have significantly higher odds of using cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And people who report only some difficulty in health in self-care have higher odds of smoking cigarettes and cigars. So this disparity in tobacco product use among people with disability highlights the need for interventions tailored toward this population and further research um, that explicitly addresses this population. I'm gonna leave it there so we can get to questions. Thanks a lot, Jay. Does anyone have any questions for Jay? Yeah, this is uh, Saul Schiffman. Just uh, very briefly, uh, it looked as though from the slide uh, that was the, the graphs, that one way of looking at the data is not only that there's higher smoking prevalence as uh, disability increases in severity, but that the shortfall, if you will, between cigarettes and e-cigarettes uh, grows greater because it looked like there was not much increase. Uh, and I, I just wonder if you think that also suggests a maybe more misperceptions about relative risk or something else that uh, keeps that from being proportional. Obviously, I needed to go to the poster. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm just bringing the poster up so we can all see. Um, and do you mind, uh, can everyone? Scroll up a, a little bit to the next. Screen. Yeah, so we wanna look at, if my computer works, um, cigarette compared to e-cigarette and that there's less of a, a, a difference is that? That's what yeah, you're- In other words, if we, uh, you, uh, current smoking of cigarettes goes up pretty steeply with increasing mm -hmm. disability. But yeah. It's pretty flat across severity of disability for e-cigarettes. Yes. So, so from one, so one way to think about that is, is that among smokers, those with more disability are relatively less likely uh, to use e-cigarettes or switch to e-cigarettes. So there's a, uh, uh, if you will, a, a disparity, not only in current smoking prevalence, but a disparity in uh, the potential to switch from cigarettes to e-cigarettes. Yes, that's, yeah. That, that's very striking to me and, and worth some exploration if you have a chance. Yeah, thank you for that. I haven't thought too much about that. I am still um, fairly new to the tobacco world. I come more from like oh, an ability, so. Yeah, like three months into it, but that's a that's a um, good point you raise, and we can definitely look into that more. Cool, look forward to it. I have a Hi, question as well. Oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Can you say more about um, how disability is assessed? That's a, is that's a wonderful question too. And that's something we looked about and thought about here as well too. Cause like, so what I've kind of noticed since joining the tobacco world, I feel like if people focus on tobacco use and people with disabilities, it's around mental illness, right? We've seen some of that today. Um, and we're not looking at other types of disabilities necessarily. Um, so the, in national surveys, there's six standard questions that they ask. Um, and that's what we see here, right? Um, do you have difficulty hearing even when wearing a hearing aid? Do you have difficulty going up and down um, steps, I think is for the mobility. And the American Community Survey, the standard six questions are like a dichotomous yes or no. Um, what we use is from the, N, the NHIS is, it's called the Washington Group Short Set on Functioning. And they frame it so you can look at difficulty level, but this is all self-reported to these six questions. Um, do you have difficulty doing doing these these functioning domains? And it's kind of from like from more of a social model of disability and from the the ICF um, how they define disability too. But that's a good question, and it, it and it makes a difference on the prevalence too on how you kind of ask it um, and what set of questions you use. So that's something we looked at. Yeah, I guess I was originally thinking about like functional limitations and activities of daily living. Um, yeah, so the um, a, the American Community Survey, their six questions, instead of using communication here, they ask about um, independent living. So if you would use a different survey, we could get we could get at that. Okay, thank you. Jay, I was wondering, um, oh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you've done any analyses or if you have any plan to look at whether um, there's like an additive effect of having, you know, numerous impairments or maybe a multiplicative effect. Um, no, as far as tobacco product use, no. Um, there was, I don't know. I'm not going to remember it well enough to say strongly what they said. There is like reporting one functioning limitation does increase the chances of having another one or something like that. Like like looking at not as it relates to, to tobacco product use, there is some relationship in between what you would say to one and another one. Um, but we have not, and I think we could with these, these data. So I, I'm going to make a note about that as well. Yeah, we did um, a paper a couple of years ago that was using um, classification and regression tree modeling. And it's sort of a funny like machine learning technique that like rank orders like the, the relative weight of importance that, that each you know, risk factor might have. And then you, mm -hmm. you split the population in, into these different you know, sort of buckets and you get an overall prevalence for the population that, you know, is characterized by you know certain risk factors, so something like that could potentially be interesting. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but that's interesting. It yeah. was cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Jay? Um, okay, great. So we will move on then to our fourth presenter, um, Rhiannon Wiley who again is from Vermont Center on Behavior and Health, and she is gonna be discussing factors influencing smoking trajectory among vulnerable populations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Take it, Rhiannon. Are you muted, Rhiannon? Are you? There we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? All right, great. Thanks. Now let me get that slide set up for you. All right. Um, yeah, thank you, Sully, and thanks everyone for coming. This is um, my poster presentation on um, factors in, oops, sorry, factors influencing smoking trajectory um, amongst vulnerable populations. So it's very in line with um, a lot of the research that we've been doing here at the VCBH. Um, I am a predoctoral trainee here. Um, 
And these are my disclosures before we begin. So the background for this research um, begins with uh, the idea of vulnerable populations. So as you might have heard, um, smoking prevalence and related disease burden um, are elevated amongst specific vulnerable populations. Um, in specific for this research, we're looking at women of low socioeconomic status of childbearing age, uh, people who um, are in recovery from opioid use disorder, and people who have affective disorders. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we've found the CDC says that um, smoking is a risk factor for COVID-19 for you know, uh, adverse health outcomes and death. And emerging research has also um, suggested that people who uh, in the general population who smoke um, have been changing their smoking patterns during the pandemic. So we had some questions about this. Um, we wanted to know uh, amongst the vulnerable populations, have their smoking patterns changed during the pandemic? And if so, you know, what psychosocial risk factors um, might uh, distinguish people with different smoking trajectories? To accomplish this, we went back to um, participants of a prior um, large randomized control trial that we conducted here um, at the VCBH, and um, we recontacted them um, during um, June, June through November of 2020, while the pandemic was happening. Um, and we administered a survey to them, asking them about their current cigarettes per day. Um, we asked them a bunch of questions about the pandemic, and we also asked them to recall what their CPD was during February of 2020, which we um, took as the date of, you know, kind of the, the last month before uh, COVID became uh, really widespread in the US and all of the lockdowns started to happen here. For our analyses, um, contacting some of these populations and given how long it had been since we had um, been in contact with them for the prior study, um, amongst our respondents, the vast majority were still smoking at the time that we recontacted them. Of the people who had quit smoking, 78% of them had quit before COVID. Um, and of all of the respondents, uh, slightly over half believed that their smoking did increase their risks associated with COVID-19. So looking at our main outcomes, so for our model, um, again, we took our time points as pre and during COVID, our co-variables um, that we had, we're looking at some of these variables associated with our original study design and some of potential interactions. We also included some of the risk factors um, that we've mentioned previously. And overall, we found that CPD was higher during COVID than uh, the pre-COVID uh, time point. And this was a difference of about one and a half cigarettes. So again, we saw that time was significant in this model. So CPD increased from pre-COVID to during COVID. We also saw a difference by population. So across both time points, people who are opioid dependent had higher CPD than those with affective disorders. People who are older had higher CPD across both time points and people who with only a high school degree or less had higher CPD. It's not particularly surprising. Um, with our follow-up analysis, looking at change in CPD, um, the only psychosocial risk factor that was associated with change in CPD was employment. So we saw that individuals who were currently employed had a smaller increase in CPD uh, compared to people who were unemployed. So this, you can, as you can see in the table, um, people who were employed had an increase of about 0.69 cigarettes per day, and people who were unemployed had almost a three cigarette per day increase. So in summary, uh, we found that smokers uh, were per these people smokers from these vulnerable populations were perceiving that the tobacco use that their tobacco use did exacerbate the risk from COVID nineteen. Um, smoking increased overall uh, amongst these vulnerable populations, but there was heterogeneity in the smoking trajectories during the pandemic. Um, so there were some differences by population and um, age group, uh, but in terms of trajectory, it was those who were unemployed who had the greatest change in smoking. Of course, this uh, research is limited. Um, this is a convenience sample. 
of course, there's going to be response bias and recall bias with this type of study methodology and our kind of pre post questions are, are insensitive to dynamic changes in CPD. We had some free text responses where people indicated that their CPD had kind of yo yoed during the pandemic based off of like individual personalized events. And so those people were not really captured in this analysis. Um, but our overall takeaways from this are that, you know, vulnerable populations might be uniquely affected by public health crises like the pandemic, um, and unemployment seems to be an important factor to take into account, and future research is needed to differentiate those who are most vulnerable in the face of these kinds of pandemics. And so thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, any questions for Rhiannon? to take your best guess what do you think is driving the increase in consumption other than other than the risk factor so what is it about for example unemployment specifically good question so a couple these are my guesses one is that if you are unemployed you've got more time on your hands um people who are employed might be depending on like what their situation is be in situations where they're not able to smoke as much like depending on like if they're at work and there's like a no smoking you know policy or like it's requiring them to be masked all the time and the, the other guess could be like they just be more stressed so they're smoking more because they're stressed so absent qualitative data i i, I wouldn't really know why but those are my thoughts how do I think these results might be similar or different for general populations? You know, I, I don't I don't know if you're aware of how these patterns have been changing for the general problems. Do you see them? Do you see things moving in the same or do you expect that they would move in a different direction or a similar one? Um, in terms of kind of like overall like cigarette per day change. From what I understand of like the surveys that have gone out, they haven't quite looked at it in, in like kind of the same way that we did, but people are kind of self-reporting like, it's like a third of people say that they've tried to quit or they've decreased. And then like a third of people say that they've increased and like another third of people haven't changed. So that's kind of different from the proportions that we're seeing. Um, in terms of like psychosocial like risk factors, I haven't necessarily seen anything that looks at that in the general population relating it to cigarette change during the pandemic. Thank you. Any other questions? We've got a lot of time. Uh, I have a question. Um, so are you, are you thinking of maybe measuring again because there's been some, you know, some thinking of how many phases the pandemic is going through and will probably continue to go through. Do you expect people to, to settle into a different pattern in this? Is this sort of like an initial reaction to this, this major job loss, major event? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I, I, I really don't know because we haven't, collected data since that first wave. Um, if I had known <laughs> that the pandemic would have lasted this long when I first designed the survey, I probably would have thought to include a second wave. But, ah, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Great answer. Yeah. Um, thank you, great talk. Any questions for any of the presenters? I actually had a question for Seon Kim. Um, I was curious if um, when you looked at demographics around race and ethnicity and income, um, if you cross-tabbed any of that data and if the numbers were different um, versus your overall results, if there were changes. As in the whether the outcome was different based on Correct. the baseline demographics. Correct. Um, off the top of my head, I think there was some effect of marital status. If you're married compared to like never married or divorced people who are not in a married relationship, 
they were more likely to achieve that in the outcome. But I think demograph from demographic, that was the most prominent one. Otherwise, it wasn't really a factor. So Su Young uh, published a paper on uh, uh, differences both by ethnicity and by disadvantages such as uh, low income, low education, uh, and uh, uh, psychiatric conditions uh, that looked at. Uh, so she, she's, she's uh, missing an opportunity to, to promote herself, uh, but she has a paper you could put the the link to it in the uh, sure. uh, in the chat uh, that deals with uh, how uh, switching outcomes varied uh, by socio demographic factors, and particularly those we think of as associated with uh, disadvantages or uh, disparities. Would be great. Thank you. So we have um, one final presenter, uh, Nicole Krebs from the Penn State College of Medicine. And she is going to be presenting on, um, does race moderate the effects of reduced nicotine content cigarettes among smokers? So Nicole, welcome. And if you're all set, um, go ahead and share your screen, please. First, I'd like to say I, I clicked on the wrong link. So I'm so sorry that I'm late to this. Um, no worries. No, the technical <laughs> problems always I realized, happen. I realized I was in the wrong group. So let's see. Um, can you see my presentation? We see your notes and your presentation. Yeah. Okay, there it goes. Okay. There you go. yeah. So, so my presentation um, today is on just race moderate the effects of reduced nicotine content cigarettes among smokers. Um, my name is Nicole Krebs, and I am a current research project manager and doctor. Uh, DRPH doctoral student, both at the Penn State College of Medicine. So there's limited research with reduced nicotine uh, cigarettes focusing on race. Uh, Carol et al. recently found greater reductions in smoking-related outcomes that was cigarettes per day, exhaled CO, and in an owl in an immediate versus a no nicotine reduction group comparison, regardless of white or black race. Although they did see reductions in total nicotine equivalence was greater for whites than blacks in the immediate reduction versus no nicotine reduction group. Pearson et al. surveyed support for nicotine reduction by racial groups and found more support among African-Americans and Hispanics than whites. So we wanted to look at race as a moderator in our two uh, randomized clinical trials with smokers with uh, low socioeconomic status or a mood and or anxiety disorder. So both trials randomized participants into a usual nicotine content group or a gradual nicotine reduction group over 18 weeks. Uh, the nicotine reduction group um, used cigarettes that were reduced in nicotine from 11.6 to 0 0.2 milligrams per cigarette. So the sample included 403 adult smokers, uh, 104 blacks, 299 whites, and the sites included Penn State University at Hershey, Pennsylvania, George Washington University in Washington, DC, and Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. So we used adjusted linear regression models to examine race by treatment interactions, on uh, outcomes at week 18, and this was week 18 post-randomization. So for baseline results, we found uh, Blacks had uh, lower cigarettes per day, lower carbon monoxide, and lower cotinine than white smokers. Uh, blacks were also more likely to be, uh, were older and more likely to be male and menthol smokers. 
In our linear regression models, uh, we saw that for the outcomes, uh, total cigarettes per day, exhaled CO, and Fagerstrom tests for cigarette dependence uh, were similar. Uh, we saw similar reductions in white and black smokers in RNC versus UNC uh, smokers at week 18. Uh, for cotinine, we saw uh, larger reductions in cotinine for white smokers versus black smokers at week 18. Uh, we also saw differences in compliance with uh, using the reduced nicotine cigarettes um, between blacks and white smokers. We found 61% non-compliance in blacks versus 44% non-compliance in whites. Um, and uh, so this could be driving the differences in uh, nicotine or in cotinine reduction for the white and black smokers. So Carol et al. The Carol et al. paper also found more non-compliance in blacks. Uh, possible reasons for this could be brand loyalty. We know the vast majority of uh, Blacks smoke Newport menthol cigarettes, upwards of 80% in some studies. And we also like to look at differences in withdrawal symptoms between Black and white smokers uh, to see if this could be driving um, differences in compliance and then for, therefore differences in cotinine reductions. As for future research, um, examining outcomes associated with reduced nicotine content cigarettes and other racial groups, such as Asians, Hispanic and Latinos, and Native Americans is still needed. And thank you, and I can take any questions. Great, thanks a lot. So we've got about um, six minutes left for questions. Rianne, and I saw in the chat that you worked on this study as an undergrad. That's kind of funny. Yes, for a brief moment in time, I was responsible for labeling a lot of test tubes. Any questions for anyone? Jay, you might you might have covered this during your presentation, um, but from what I remember, you collected disability data using these kind of five factors that would uh, split into the different subtypes or kind of this taxonomy of disability. Did you do any analysis looking at differential rates of CPD based on? Sorry, you cut out at the very end. You said, did I do any sort of differential analysis looking at CPD as well? So just looking looking at, at, the, at the rates of smoking based on not the sum total severity of the disability, but on the type that it would be. I guess the question that I'm trying to get at is that I would imagine you'd see differential rates of, of, um, of nicotine consumption for somebody who is like has a respiratory disability compared to like a mobility, for example. Oh, no, we did not. But again, I, th I think you probably could get at that because the Enheis asks about that as well, doesn't it, at some point? So we could. Um, yeah, we didn't, but it's a good question. And it's another, so there's, and, and it goes back to, I forget who asked about the questions. The questions themselves aren't perfect, right? And there's a lot of I mean, people use different questions and then there's a national survey on disability and health that uses a slightly different like framing of the question, but would be able to like explicitly would ask them around some of that, that like that issue. Um, so no, we did not. <laughs> it's I guess the very short answer to that. Okay, well, if no one has any other questions, um, I guess we can go ahead and call it. So thank you all very much for attending this poster session and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks, Sully.